everybody and a very warm welcome to Tapas Project Shala. I'm Preeti Vikram, founder of Tapas, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Tapas Project Shala's second annual conference, and this is a virtual conference that we host every year, and this is our second edition, uh, extends a warm welcome to all the audience members. We are really, really happy to have our speaker with us today, and this is Mr. John Lama. A Hello. very warm welcome, John Lama. Hello. Nice to be here with you from California. <laughs> uh, just to tell you a little bit about our speaker today, Mr. John Lama has been a thought leader and an expert on project-based learning for over 20 years. He has helped build the Buick Institute for Education, or now it is known as PVL Works, where he served as its editor-in-chief. He co-developed their model for gold standard PBL and contributed to the creation of the framework for high quality PBL. John is the author of many blog posts, articles and books on PBL, including Setting the Standard for Project-Based Learning and with Susie Boss, Project-Based Teaching. He has spoken at conferences in China, Australia, Chile and other countries and is now Senior PBL Advisor for Defined Learning. He began his career as a high school uh, social studies and English teacher in California. Who better than Mr. John Lama to talk about project-based learning with all of us? A very warm Thank welcome you. once again, Mr. Lama. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. So there's so many questions we have, so many things that we want to ask you. But um, let me begin with the most basic question, which is, can you describe what a typical inquiry-based classroom looks like? Sure, it's, uh, it's an active looking classroom. You, you might see students occasionally, you know, sitting in at their desk listening to a teacher, but usually you'll see students being active. They're working in teams, they're perhaps sitting around tables, they're moving around the room. Some students might be, you know, going out of the room to do something. Um, there could be students doing different things. One team is over here looking at a video. Some other team is meeting with a teacher. Other teams are meeting with each other to give each other feedback on their work. So you'll see a lot of variety of activities. Um, the teacher is not always in front of the room. The teacher is sort of roaming around the room sometimes, checking in with students, talking to small groups, perhaps individuals. Um, so there's a mix of activities and the teacher is not always up there in front giving a lecture. Doesn't mean there isn't room for the occasional lecture, but it's, it's not what you see all the time. Uh, you'll hear a lot of student voice. The students are not afraid to speak up, ask questions, share their opinions, share their ideas um, with each other and with, with the teacher or other adults that might be in the room. Actually, you might see other adults in the room. The teacher might have invited a local expert or someone from the community or the business world or a scientist or someone from a university to visit the classroom and help act as an expert advisor for students. Um, you'll see things in the walls that look different from a traditional classroom. You might see, for example, a list of norms or agreements about how we're going to work together or um, a driving question for a project posted on a poster. You might see a step-by-step -step set of directions for how we always attack problems or how we work together in teams. So things like that on the wall, sort of artifacts that show the classroom culture is different. Um, the, the culture itself sort of feels different. You, you feel like students have some ownership over what they're doing. They, they're, they're engaged, they're, um, they're smiling, they're, or they're thinking hard at least sometimes. Uh, there's a high degree of trust in the room, that students trust the teacher is sort of there to help them, not just the, you know, the person who's gonna give them a grade. Uh, there's a close relationships. Um, the teacher knows students well and students feel supportive of, the, of each other. There's kind of a, colla a collaborative relationship in the classroom. Um, and you'll see certain routines sometimes. You'll see students always using, say, a similar protocol for giving each other feedback on their work. Or when it's project work time, the students know what to do. They will move into their project teams and use a similar process for getting started on their work. Um, and finally, I think you'd, you'd see a lot of reflection, students sort of pausing to think about what they're doing. The teacher might pause the whole group at some times. Okay, how are we doing? What do we need? Are we making progress on the project? 
And uh, you'll see a sense of celebration too when things are getting accomplished, when milestones are reached or when the project has reached its, its conclusion, you'll see uh, a sense of celebration in the room. Right. And that sounds so different from a conventional school where the onus of imparting education is on, on the teacher, on the facilitator. And when I say education, it's more the information that's being imparted. So in this kind of an environment where the onus of learning is on the student, uh, from what you said, uh, a lot of the learning is happening because it's student-led. In this kind of an environment, what do you think is the role of a facilitator? What happens to uh, you know the person who's supposed to be doing the teaching? Okay. Well, first, I would I would like to say uh, that there is still some room for teaching in in project based learning. So, teacher, teachers are sometimes afraid uh, to change their role so much and say, "But I'm I'm still the expert on history or mathematics or science or whatever," and that's true. And there's still a time when the teacher does have to teach the content of of the course, whatever students need to complete the project successfully. But as I said, a lot of the time the teacher is acting more like a facilitator to make sure students are moving forward in the project, that their teams are working well, that they're getting access to the technology or the equipment they need. Um, I, I like the metaphor teacher as coach, kind of like a coach for a sports team where, you know, the goal is clear to, to win the game or to complete the project and make a nice presentation at the end of it, perhaps. And so the coach is there to kind of support the students along the way in the same way an, a sports coach uh, supports the players in a team. You uh, have practice sessions, you build the, you build the skills, you um, have them uh, complete, you know, small steps along the way toward putting it all together to play the game. Um, another, another term I like to, to use with project-based learning uh, teachers is that they're a lead learner because in a true project-based learning ex environment, the teacher does not really know the correct answer all the time. It's not, the students are exploring a question perhaps, or they're trying to create something or meet a challenge where the teacher hasn't done it before exactly, or there's many, many ways to answer the question. And so the teacher is kind of learning along with the students and sort of modeling perhaps how to think and how to ask questions. And so that idea of a lead learner, I think, which is a great uh, metaphor for a teacher as a facilitator. Um, the teacher has to know their students well, which you know, I taught high school in California, like you said, and, and a lot of high school teachers don't know their students that well because there are a lot of students compared to an elementary school and they see their role as more to just deliver deliver knowledge, the content, not to really know their students well, but it really does, the, the relationship should be much closer in a project-based learning environment. Um, the teacher knows their students, they know how to sort of tailor a project to help meet their needs, to find projects that are of interest to their students, that are going to be engaging for them. Uh, the teacher holds uh, high expectations though. Uh, Lisa Delpit's term, a warm demander, is a good one. It's it's you know your students well. You support them. You're 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 warm, but you also demand a lot of them. You hold high expectations, and the students kind of know that. They they know it might be a struggle sometimes. This project is hard. We're we're reaching some times once in a while. We we don't know what we're doing, or we reach it. We we go down the wrong path and have to revise our work. But the teacher is there as a coach, sort of supporting their progress and sort of saying, "Well, I know you can do it." Let's try another approach. Right. That's fantastic. And so I think um, uh, what you said kind of throws a lot of light on what the teacher is supposed to be. I really love the term lead learner. I think that sets the yeah. context for how the person is throughout the, throughout the year. And right. I, I right. Think, I've heard uh, Excuse me. I've heard, I've heard teachers say, I have to pass this one along. I've had teachers say after they've done project-based learning for the first time, they say, this is how I've always wanted to teach. Uh -huh. you know, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's much more engaging for teachers. It's a much more rewarding way for teachers to teach compared to just delivering the same lecture with the PowerPoints day in and day yeah. out. Yeah. I, I think it's more intuitive. You, you work on what you think is the right approach. And so I think that comes naturally to a teacher than the right. forced approach. 
So do you think, and, and this is something that I, uh, I I want to ask you when it comes to practitioners choosing this line uh, and, and this medium of uh, instruction. So do you think it's easier or more difficult for a teacher? And I know that this is a bit of a tangent just for all the practitioners who are uh, with us here today. Do you think it's easier or more difficult for them? That's a good question. At the beginning, when a teacher is first starting out using project-based learning, it can feel more difficult because it's new, it's unfamiliar. Um, the first time a teacher plans a project, it can take more time than just planning a daily lesson because a project usually lasts for several weeks. So there's a little bit more to plan in advance, but that gets easier. After you teachers get used to it, planning a project becomes quicker. And especially if they're able to collaborate with each other as a team of teachers, then planning projects is really fun. It can be very efficient. And you can use the same projects over the years too, which saves some planning time. But, um, but it is challenging for teachers at first if they're, if they're used to only lecturing and say delivering you know, PowerPoint slides they've had for five years, 10 years, the same stuff over and over again, that's pretty easy. And they're grading a multiple choice test. I mean, but that's not truly teaching, I think. I mean, I think teaching needs to change. It's not how students really learn. It's not how the brain works. There's a lot of research on that. Um, so anyway, I think, I think teachers, after a while, PBL feels easier because uh, once a project is kind of moving along, especially if you've done it a few times before, you kind of know where it's going. You don't, you don't know the exact answer or the exact product students might create, but you, you, you feel more comfortable. You can sort of relax during the project. It's not like preparing you get to prepare a lesson every single day, like in traditional teaching. Um, and it's so rewarding and fun that it, it, I think it might feel easier in that respect too. Right, super. So uh, that brings me to what kind of skills are learned in project-based learning or an inquiry-based learning approach? And then how do you kind of map the learning outcomes to the curriculum? So how do you, how do you put all of it together? Yeah, well, I think uh, projects should be designed by the teacher or co-developed with students, perhaps. Uh, if students get more experience with PBL, you can co-develop projects with them. I think you should keep your curriculum in mind. In, in the United States, we call you know our standards, our content standards, what you're supposed to teach in your subject area. You should still target the important standards or cu curriculum that you're supposed to teach. Uh, the ones that require in-depth understanding and are more complex are good for to, you, to teach during projects. Uh, so you can sort of map your projects across your school year and see which, which curriculum standards make the most sense to teach with a project. doesn't mean you have to do all projects all the time. Now, at your school, perhaps that is how it works. And there are some schools in the United States who work that way, too, and that's great. Uh, but a lot of teachers, when they're starting out, they think, oh, do I have to do all projects all the time? And no, I say no, not at first. You can mix some of your traditional teaching with projects. But I think after a while, students will begin asking for more projects and you'll want to do more too. So I think you'll grow the number of projects over time that you do that you do in a year. Um, so you'll find the students are gaining a lot of content knowledge uh, and it, they're, they're retaining it longer because it, it, they care about it, it sinks in deeper, it's more active learning, their brains are engaged compared to just memorizing for a test. They actually do retain their knowledge longer. So don't worry about the subject knowledge. They're still going to learn that in a well-designed project, but they're also going to learn those, those so-called 21st century skills, things like uh, critical thinking and solving problem solving, uh, collaboration, which is so important in the world of work today in, the, in our modern economy, um, creativity and innovation, you know, how, to, how to come up with ideas and test your ideas and, and produce uh, creative products. Communication with an audience when you present among your team, communication with an expert, ask them for, for their expertise to help you with a project, uh, written communication, presentations, using media and technology. So lots of different ways that communication skills are built. So all those skills are valuable in the workplace. They're valuable in college and further education and in life in general. And um, oh, and project management skills. I mean, that's something else that's so valuable on the job. I mean, most people who work have to, you know, manage a project of some sort where you've got to set goals and you've got to figure out who's, who's doing what task and what are our deadlines and what are our checkpoints. Um, 
So the project management skills, I mean, how can you build those if you're not doing projects in school? Um, so it's, um, you're, you're gaining a lot, of, a lot more than traditional teaching. And sometimes we think, people think, oh, I teach critical thinking or how to solve a problem, perhaps in mathematics or in science or whatever. And that's true, but um, students may not be able to transfer that kind of problem solving and critical thinking to other situations. Uh, and so I think with project-based learning, it teaches them transferable skills, which they can use in many different contexts later on. And I think that's brilliant because I think uh, today those are the skills which are most important with artificial intelligence and machine learning kind of taking over our lives. Very soon we see that a lot of the entry level jobs are going to be replaced by machines. So I think it's these skills that are going to set us apart and these skills which will be the need of the future. So it's important that children are able to transfer these. Right. And and I mean, the, the, the content knowledge is all right here in in your hand, you know, that's, you, students have, the facts are, you can access them so easily. The information is all around us. I mean, they should still know some basic information, of course, in different subject areas, but knowing how to use the information and how to, how to use it to create something, that's what PBL can teach. Absolutely. So how does assessment look in something like this, in, in an inquiry-based classroom or a a PBL classroom, what does assessment look like? Because I think that's a big question in parents' minds. Like, how do I know what my child is learning? Yes, that's that's always a big question. That's, that's one of the more challenging aspects. Um, so first again, first of all, I would again say that you can use some traditional assessment tools in PBL. Mm -hmm. It's okay to give students a quiz now and then to see if they've learned some content knowledge. Um, even a test sometimes is, is, is a way to assess individual learning. And they're still writing, you know, uh, having written assignments so you can judge individual learning in the, through their writing. Um, but you also need to assess what they call performance assessment, where students are doing something. And so you might have rubrics, for example, to describe what a good presentation is like or uh, a rubric for what a well-designed uh, product uh, should be like. And so you're able to use the, you know, the criteria are listed in the rubric, which might be also reflect your curriculum standards. And then the rubric is used both to guide the students. There's a lot of formative assessment in project-based learning. It's very important to, to check students' work along the way. And for students to check themselves and get peer feedback, feedback from experts or whoever the, maybe there's someone who they're designing a project, a product for, and you want to mm -hmm. get feedback on your rough draft or your prototype from someone that you're designing the project, the product for. So there's a lot more need for, for good formative, you know, assessment of work in progress to, to make it better, to improve it, as well as summative assessment at the end. And that's where the summative assessment at the end of a project to look back, what did we learn? So as I said, there could be a test, there could be, there's a rubric that captures what a good product should look like. You might also have students uh, reflect on what they're learning. Um, they could keep a journal, they could pause and talk to each other or talk as a whole class about what they're learning. Um, as, to, as a teacher walks around the room, they can uh, overhear students, they can sit with a team and monitor their, what they're talking about and see if students are understanding something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then make adjustments. If students need to be retaught something, or you, can, you can tell students don't understand a concept they need for the project. Then you say, okay, guys, let's let's pause today and we're going to stop and I'm going to give you a brief lecture on X, Y, or Z. Okay. So um, there's a lot more of that sort of assessment as needed for the project that happens. There aren't as many daily assignments typically in PBL. A lot of teachers love to have, you know, assignments with points given every day and, or number of points. So there are fewer assignments like that. And so mm -hmm. it's important for for, for students to understand that and parents understand, you may not get a daily point count. Uh, you may not have as many little assignments that you can add up and see how you're doing. Um, I also would advise people not to put too much emphasis on a team created product. Don't, don't grade just the team product and give everyone the same grade. You should ask students to report on what they did, ask peers to sort of say who did what in the group, um, mm -hmm. I've heard some teachers don't even grade the final product. They, they rely on individual assessments only. And that's how students earn their grades for the course. And the team created product 
uh, it's still teams still want it to be high quality because they're going to present it usually sure. to an audience or someone who's actually going to use their product. They still want to do good quality work, mm -hmm. but um, to grade a team product can be tricky. And so I always advise teachers, most of the grades should be based on individual work, not the teamwork. That's great advice. I think it, may, it definitely makes sense that children are assessed on their individual capabilities. And, and when you were talking about rubrics and assessment based on those rubrics, it also brought an idea that children could be part of making those rubrics also. They could have oh, a yes. voice in what the rubrics look like. Exactly. If you have students helping develop the criteria to judge their work, I mean, think of how powerful that is. They, they really understand right from the beginning, like, okay, I'm trying to do this and good quality work looks like this. The rubric is in student-friendly language. I helped write this rubric. I looked at some models, perhaps, and used the rubric to assess the model. And so they, they, they really internalize the criteria for good quality work. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we, we spoke a little bit about the 21st century skills and how that might affect their, uh, their future in terms of their uh, jobs and what you know, transferable skills in their jobs. But that kind of brings me to the question that can PBL, uh, learning through this method, help students start planning their career paths, their educational pathways to reach those careers that they want? What are your thoughts? I think project-based learning is a great way to introduce students to uh, future possibilities for their careers. Um, because students bring students, projects bring students out into the real world. They're not just learning things for school. They're doing things in the real world. They're connecting with people, adult professionals, perhaps, um, people in their community, business people, organizations in their, in their region, in their country, across the world. So they're being exposed to all these different places and people and professions and kinds of work and the kinds of problems people in the real world uh, face on the job. So for some students who, who sort of have a very small little world, they're a small little town, uh, they've never been, never traveled much, they're, they're, maybe they aren't exposed to a lot of different kinds of jobs, projects can really bring them out into the world. And a lot of projects, uh, the, actually the company I work for now, Define Learning, all of their projects in their uh, online library are tied to a career role. So students are given a role, like you're an engineer trying to design a pedestrian bridge over this stream, or you're a, um, a playground designer trying to redesign a playground for a park, or a civil engineer or an aircraft designer. And so, and then, and then students are learning then about the career because they're acting, they're trying to sort of take on that role during the project. And they, they're, it may be a simulation. I mean, they're not really an aircraft designer, obviously, but they're, they're learning what it takes, what the standards are for aircraft design, the kind of tools an aircraft designer might use. And they're making a presentation to the kind of audience that an aircraft designer might really show their work to. So um, it can be very engaging for students. I mean, they, they, they they're, uh, I mean, sometimes actually, I mean, the best ones, I think, are the ones where students are in their community actually doing some doing some good in their community, where they're solving some local problem or there's some issue in their community, which they are helping to address. Um, I mean, imagine how how empowering that can be for a student who who, who sort of thinks to themselves, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a kid. What what do I know? What, what can I do? But students who do projects that make an impact on the world outside of school, uh, they really feel empowered. They, they have a sense of agency that they can do things. They feel a sense that they, they have responsibility. They, they, they were persistent. They, they were able to learn some of those. That's another thing they've learned with PBL is some of those great personal qualities like persistence or uh, you know growth, having a growth mindset that I can do this if I try hard. Um, and if I take responsibility for this, it's, it makes them feel good that they're, they're not just a, a little child. They actually have made a contribution to the world and then they're ready to go when they want to get further along in their career or in college or wherever. Absolutely. And I think these are really important skills that uh, you know, being able to persist on a, on a task is something that I believe cannot be taught with a classroom where there is a teaching and a learning happens. It has to be something that you imbibe 
in the children. So uh, that cannot be done in any other way other than PBM. Right, right. right. Because a, a traditional assignment may just take a day or so, or maybe it takes 15 minutes, or maybe it takes a day or two. I, mean, I can see maybe a longer research paper would take more time in high school, but uh, yeah. but a project that lasts two or three weeks, students really have to think differently and work differently. They can't just you know quickly write something the night before it's due and turn it in the next day. They've got to create high quality work, and so they get to pay, they pay, they care more. They pay more attention to the quality of their work, and they're they they have to learn more along the way. They they don't they don't know it all at the beginning. They can't learn it quickly. It takes some time to learn to test out their prototypes, like I said, or their rough drafts of written work. So they, they're learning a lot of things that are, that's the way the world works. Um, and most people in the world in, in many, in more and more jobs are, are doing projects. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, that kind of brings me to the question that, is this something that can be practiced across the world? Are there any cultural contexts that might throw some challenges or um, in a broader sense, what are the challenges in implementing PBL? Okay. Well, there are some challenges. A lot of them have to do with, um, let's see, I'll start with the, the challenge of, of just what people think of as learning and teaching. And so the traditional model for teaching and learning is the teacher is the, the dispenser of knowledge. The, you, the teacher is pouring knowledge into an empty head. Um, that's sort of the traditional view of teaching and learning, right? Uh, which has been with us for, for centuries. So project-based learning sort of, as I said, it doesn't mean there's no teaching at all going on. There is still some knowledge being imparted to students by the teacher, but um, it's much more active and students are learning for themselves and it's much more, they call constructivist style learning. And so the whole model of teaching is different. And that's, that's a challenge for people to sort of, think about and change their perspective on for teachers or for the general public, for parents, for students. I mean, I've heard, I've heard students in a, when they first tried doing project-based learning say, what are we learning? Are we learning teacher? I mean, they're not getting the usual assignments, you know, and the points and the quizzes. Uh, but then at the end of the project, they look back and say, wow, we learned a lot. We just didn't quite realize it at the time how much we were learning. So everybody has to sort of rethink their concept of teaching and learning. Um, uh, so that that's part of it, and the teacher then has to you know think of themselves as more the facilitator and the coach, not just the the content expert. Um, so that's one that's one area, sort of a, the, the concept of teaching and learning. Another one is uh, structure, the school structures, and just the way our education system is set up. So, I mean, I taught at a high school, which typically in, in the United States, students go through seven periods a day, different classes, different classrooms, different teachers maybe 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes per period. And that's not enough time to really do project-based learning well. So school structures need to change with longer blocks of time and perhaps fewer teachers per student, or maybe they don't meet every day, they meet every other day or something. So school structures are one of the barriers and the challenges, um, which special, special schools like yours and charter schools in the United States have been able to overcome. Uh, but sort of the mm -hmm. traditional school in, in around the world, um, they're pretty much governed, you know, by the central government or their state government here, and and for a hundred more than a hundred years, that's been the way schools have been designed, like factories, where students move along an assembly line, a conveyor belt, getting the input from different teachers until they reach the end of the line as an educated person. So the factory model has been with us a long time, and um, but it's the 21st century. We can we can move beyond the factory, I think. So uh, a big part of that, that factory model is the test and testing is so important. And most countries around the world have, pardon me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's true in the United States, I'm sure in India, China, uh, in Europe, um, the, the, the national exams are so important to get it, for getting into college and moving on in your education. So uh, I, I think project-based learning done well can prepare students for those important exams. Um, but I think it's a barrier. A lot of teachers think they have to just cover the content. They have to just charge through the curriculum and lecture, lecture, lecture every day to make sure they cover it all by the time the test comes around. And I would maintain that memorizing is not really teaching. Um, students forget what they learn. You know, they, they, 
they forget the test the next week or the next uh, the next day. So, um, you know, there's there's room for tests. Tests have a role in the system somewhere, but they shouldn't be quite so important. So I think teachers um, need to be supported in that. So they're the school leaders in their school principal, their school district, their state education leaders, I think, need to need to think about how they can ease up on some of the pressure teachers feel to cover the content. Um, and, and for students just to, to think about memorizing for a test is the main way they learn. Um, oh, another big, big barrier, I should say, a big challenge is time for teachers. And I'm not sure how it is in your school or schools everywhere, but um, most schools in the United States, the teachers don't have enough time to plan. They face students uh, most of the day, they go home and grade papers, they plan the next day's lessons. Uh, but there's not much collaborative planning time. Teachers often teach alone. They don't, they don't work with other teachers. There's not much team teaching. And they feel they don't have time to plan projects and to sort of re rethink how they teach. They, they, there's too much pressure just to keep on going the way they've been going forever. So I think uh, allowing, giving teachers more time would overcome that challenge common planning time, maybe certain days of the week, there's a, it's a shorter day for students so teachers can work together to plan. Um, you asked about around the world. I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure about everywhere, but in this, in this, a lot of these things are true in the United States too. Uh, there are some cultural sort of expectations from parents and students and the community at large that students should be sort of passive learners. They should sit there quietly and listen. And that, you know, a good student is one who just sits there and takes notes and um, doesn't sort of challenge the teacher, doesn't uh, offer their own ideas too much. They're just kind of absorbing whatever the teacher delivers. So and it's, in some places that might be um, a stronger cultural component, you know, that, this, they, that to, to, to be a, a good student or a good, a good child just sits there and listens quietly. So if that person walks into a PBL classroom where students are walking around, they're talking, they're moving, um, they're, they're working in teams, it, it's just, it feels very different. So it might really uh, be challenging to sort of help them understand that this is what, you know, true good learning looks like. Um, right. I also wonder, I wonder in some places, and this is true with the United States as well as I think other countries, I think some parents may not want their children to become critical thinkers yeah. or independent thinkers, right? And so, and project-based learning they might sort of awaken students to things that they that, that some people might not want them awakened to, like some real-world problems or or some have make them ask questions or challenge the way things are, and some people might not be comfortable with with their children learning how to do that or being encouraged to do that. Absolutely, and, and so many points that you spoke about, it just resonates so well. Uh, I think traditionally, if you look at the education in India, uh, forget the time that we were colonized. This is, I'm talking about the pre-colonial times, and uh, we had a system of education called the Gurukul, where the student would reside with the guru and uh, would learn at the Gurukul. And I think the kind of education that happened at the Gurukul was very similar to what you were talking about when it comes to project-based learning, because the onus of learning was on the student, and they would learn through practice, through hands-on activities, and debating was a large part of how they learned. So uh, it, it would mean that they had to defend their own thoughts, their own ideas. It mm -hmm. meant that they had to learn all about a concept that was there in order to be able to defend their stance, right? So I think we hmm. each culture probably had developed these intuitive learning systems, which got erased and we lost our way somehow along the way, right? So um, yeah. I, I believe we all need to look back and look at our roots and find these solutions. And uh, I think that Possibly the way you spoke about PBL, it can help reconnect with those roots. So I, I think that is a possibility uh, that I do see from what you've described. Oh, that's a great point. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's a good point, though, that, to reconnect with the roots of how people really learned. That's true. I mean, students b before the industrial age, students learned on the farm and they were it was active learning. Right? They were practicing how to use the tools and 
plant the seeds and and tend the earth. So um, it, it's a more natural way to learn than just sitting in a, in a desk in a classroom all day, memorizing some information you don't really care about or you don't see as useful to your life. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my last question is having developed the gold standards for PVL. Do you think in the last 20 years, the movement has it has gained momentum. Do you see that it's being implemented more often now than before? Yes, it's definitely uh, being implemented more often now. Uh, I mean, twenty. I started with the Buck Institute for Education in two thousand one, and project based learning had been going on during the late nineteen eighties and nineties here in the states. Um, mm -hmm. And it had been going. I mean, it, it you can trace it all the way back to John Dewey in in you know nineteen twenties the progressive movement in the 1930s. And I think a lot of uh, that influenced European educators and it never fully, it, it sort of left in the United States after during World War II and after that, I think that progressive era was kind of forgotten about. But I think it's it, it stayed in a lot of European schools. They sort of still do their own style of project-based learning. They, 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 you know, Certain schools at least have been doing it for a long time there. But in America, and around the world now in the last 20 years, it's great to see. It's, it's really, the interest has really picked up. I can just tell by the number of uh, inquiries I get, the number of people who buy the books. Um, I get the Google alerts about project-based learning every day. And I see, I see a lot from India, um, a, a lot from other countries around the world. Um, and so it's very encouraging. I've been, my whole career, I've tried to been, change the structures of high schools and push on some of those challenges we've been talking about. And um, I think project-based learning is becoming popular now for a couple of reasons. It's, I think there's been a little bit of a backlash to the standards-based testing movement here in America, at least, where teachers want to teach more creatively. And, they're, and, and, and the earth part of that is students are tired of learning in the old way. I mean, they're so interconnected now with technology and they, they collaborate together online. They communicate with each other on with their phones, they're not content to just sit there and be nice passive learners. They, they, they want to be active like they are in their life outside of school. So students are demanding it, I think. Uh, and in the, and the business world, the economy has also pushed, like we said, 21st century skills are important. I think that a lot of business leaders have talked to educators and say, we need people who, know more, who can do more than just memorize information or just know, a, we can teach them the content. Well, we need our people who can solve problems and work together and and uh, take initiative and, and complete projects. That's the kind of people we want to hire. So there's been a push from the business world, too. And of course, technology has made it all easier. It's easier for students to connect with the world and do research and create products and work together, communicate with each other outside of school. It's, it's easier with technology. So all these things have come together, I think. But it's still it's still a small movement i gotta say in, in america i think it's probably only 10 percent of schools are doing some sort of project-based learning uh i mean many many more teachers in lots of places are doing it but as a whole school to do it is still fairly rare it's mostly the charter schools in the united states uh some private schools um but it's so the main education system it's slow it's like turning an oil tanker it's a very big slow turning machine so um but it's but it is changing i think i think it's it's here for good for a while i was worried that project-based learning would be one of those fads or just a trend that would fade away and i don't think that's the case i think it's going to be with us more and more people are are finding it rewarding and they're being successful with it students are successful with it so i think it will spread um i hope those systemic structural barriers get eased up that that's key i think yeah. that for education leaders to realize that those tests should not be quite so important that covering covering the content is not truly teaching yeah. so it, it 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 needs to be supported still but um i think it's here to stay and here to stay for 21st century education so um before i let you go if you can just sum up one big takeaway that our parents can have, one advice that you would give all the viewers who are watching this today, if you can just mm -hmm. help us with that. I would say, uh, try it, you'll like it. 
uh, it starts small. Don't try and design five projects and change your teaching all at once. If you if you're in a school that does that that kind of approach, fine, go for it. But if you're in a school where you're not sure if everyone else is interested in project based learning, or your school is just beginning to try developing project based learning, take small steps. Just design one project, maybe a short project, just maybe a one week project to see how it goes. Um, and I think you'll like it and you'll want to do more and more and your students will too. Fantastic. That's really great advice. Thank you so much. Baby steps and we'll get there. So yeah. Yeah. But just don't, really but don't, cool. don't let it go. Keep going. I mean, some people do one project and think, okay, that's it. I'm done. Um, now back to my traditional teaching. Uh, don't do that. Uh, try one the next semester and then try two the next year each semester and then three the next year. So have a, a long-term goal at your school or in your classroom to keep building project-based learning. Uh, don't be satisfied with just one or two little projects a year. Keep building until the majority of your time is spent doing PBL. Great. And uh, if anybody wants to further learn about PBL, are there any sites that you recommend that they visit? Are there Sure, sure. Well, um, my former organization, uh, PBL Works, has a great website with a lot of tools for teachers. Um, they do great professional development. Uh, they have online workshops as well as uh, in-person workshops. And uh, they've got uh, they have some books. I, last, my, my last book with them in 2021 was the Project Based Learning Handbook for elementary school and one for middle and high school. Um, my two books for ASCD are still in publication. So um, setting the standard for project-based learning with uh, Susie Boss and John Merkendaller, the former director of the Buck Institute. And then Susie Boss wrote uh, project-based teaching and I contributed a little bit. So I'm a co-author of that one. Uh, but So I think, you know, the books are good, but I think um, you also find great videos. Uh, PBL Works has some videos. Um, High Tech High in San Diego is a famous PBL school. And they've got a nice website with resources and videos and project examples. Um, Define Learning is the company I work for now, has online projects. And they're, they're very sort of, um, they said they're career focused and uh, the students can, can work through them on their own or in small teams. I prefer team-based projects, by the way, not just individual. They're individual there's place for individual, but team projects work, work best, I think. Um, so um, Defined Learning has these, these performance tasks or sort of mini projects, which are a great way to sort of for students, for teachers to sort of get introduced to project-based learning because they've already been designed for you and you can just uh, download them and make some adaptations for your students, but they're already designed. Um, and the other school, oh, there's also the, uh, the New Technology Network in America, uh, the New Tech Network, and they've got a website with a lot of materials of interest also. And they're one of those schools, they're, they're charter schools usually and they're wall-to-wall -wall PBL. They teach nothing but projects all year long. So um, th you'll, there's a lot now. If you, if you Google PBL, you'll get <laughs> millions of places. So um, so be careful, but because uh, there are some things out there you might find that are not really good examples of PBL. They're, mm -hmm. they're what I call a dessert project. They're kind of a fun activity, but not very in-depth or rigorous. So watch mm -hmm. out for those. Don't do some little little fun project or activity and think you're doing PBL. You, you got to make sure it's, and we talk about this in my book and setting the standard, make sure it's what I call main course project-based learning. It's the, it's the main way to teach the content. It's not just a fun activity you do after you've taught the content. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so to all the people who are viewing this uh, session, we will be putting up the links of uh, some of the things Dr. Uh, Mr. Lama has shared with us now, putting up the links in the comment section. So it's easy for all of you to visit these sites and get references for continuing this understanding of what PBL is and how it works. So with that, I think we are at the end of the session today. If you have any questions for Mr. Lama, please do put it up in the comment section and we will uh, request him to answer these and get back to you, post these back to you in, in some form. We had to do this recorded because we, um, because of the time difference between us. And so this will be played um, during the, the conference time. Uh, but Mr. Lama will answer your questions and we will.
make sure that that is posted back to you. So with that, I'd like to thank Mr. Lama for um, You're welcome. It was um, nice to be really here. That you accepted our request and so readily agreed to speak with us. And I know that you have to adjust your timings. It's pretty late in the night for you. So we are very, very thankful. And your passion and dedication towards PBL shines through. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day ahead.